All right, students, welcome to the second video out of two for topic 4.5, standing waves. And to begin this video, I'm going to talk about something called boundary conditions. Now, if you're in higher level math, um, you may have um, discussed differential, something called differential equations. I don't know if you have or, or, you, or you haven't. Um, it's, this set of this thing called boundary conditions is really more of a mathematical term that has to do with the fact uh, when you're modeling something mathematically, a set of boundary conditions are conditions that have to be met in order for a particular solution to be valid. And I'll show you what I mean when we talk about um, standing waves, okay? So again, boundary conditions are a certain set of constraints or conditions that specify the solution to a physical problem. A solution to that problem, and I'm talking about a mathematical solution, um, a solution to that problem must also satisfy the boundary conditions or else it's not valid, okay? So the physical problem is often posed as what's called a differential equation, which you, if you haven't learned about it already, you'll, you'll hopefully talk about that in calculus, okay? So, for example, the behavior of a pulse along a string, for example, as we saw in the last video, depends on whether the end is fixed or free. So, for example, in uh, illustration number one, okay, this was the fixed end, and if the end was fixed, uh, we had an inverted wave that came back to the source, right? Um, whether it, if it's free, like so if there's a ring that's free to go up and down this pole right here, it turns out that it doesn't invert and the physics is actually totally different, okay? What's interesting about number two is notice how the reflected wave from the right hand side as it goes back and hits the left it's inverted because this side is is fixed as well right okay so these are called what we call boundary conditions so two possible boundary conditions for strings are number one you have two fixed boundaries meaning both ends are fixed okay uh, you could have another combination where you have one fixed end and one free end for example and that would be shown in number two here Okay, there's another boundary condition, and that is if you had two free boundaries, okay? Uh, but this is kind of unrealistic. I mean, how would you get the string started in the first place, right? So if you imagine this end being free, uh, I guess would go up and down. You'd have a pole with a ring on this side, but it's a bit unrealistic, okay? And what if there was no end at all? What if the wave pulse just went out the window? Well, that wouldn't be very exciting because you wouldn't have any reflection and there'd be nothing uh, for the two waves. There wouldn't be anything for the wave to interfere with or interact with and they would just go flying out the window, okay? So the point is that these boundary conditions, they must be clearly stated before a physical solution to a problem is to be considered, okay? Very, very, very important. Okay, now I want to talk about something, um, an application of, sta of standing waves. Instead of talking about um, strings and slinkies and ropes, I'm going to talk about longitudinal waves, sound waves inside of pipes. It turns out that standing waves can be produced this way, all right, uh, in the same fashion as they were before, okay? So with boundary conditions for sound in pipes would be as follows. You can either have one end of the pipe closed and the other end open, okay? You could have two open ends or you could have two closed. Ends. I'm going to talk about each of these particular cases, all right? Now, two open ends, if you have two open ends, it turns out that the ends are anti-nodes, okay? And reflection occurs even though the ends are open, and that's kind of a funky thing that is a little bit surprising. I'll show you this in class. I'll demonstrate this to prove this to you, okay? So what's happening molecularly? Remember that um, sound waves are longitudinal waves, which are really uh, variations in pressure where molecules are going back and forth as the energy goes through them, okay? So you can see that um, where you have nodes, you have no movement of air molecules, such as there, there, and there, okay? And then you have maximum movement of air molecules where there's an anti-node. So, for example, there and on the ends, okay? Um, if you have two closed ends, note that uh, the ends are nodes themselves, so you have a different pressure differential here, right? So you have nodes here on the end where there's no movement of air molecules, and then maximum movement halfway in between corresponding to the anti-nodes as usual, okay? Um, you need to be familiar with how the movement of molecules can be modeled by a transverse wave. And we've talked about this before. Remember when we talked about uh, longitudinal waves and kind of sort of mapping them or envisioning them as transverse waves, which was um, easier for you guys to actually picture because you could imagine the wavelength and the frequency uh, and the period and so forth, okay? So just remember how the movement of molecules can be modeled by a transverse wave even though it really isn't a transverse wave as you know, okay? All right, so let's talk about case one. 
If we have one end open and one end closed, okay, the open end is an antinode. As we discussed before, open ends are always antinodes and closed ends are always nodes, okay? Now, it's not possible to get a complete wa uh, wavelength along L since one end is always an antinode, right? You're never going to get exactly exactly one wavelength that fits nice and neatly in there, right? Because you always have a close, you always have a node and an anti-node, right? Now there's that, lots of different co combinations of what you can fit inside of, of that length. Remember this tube, the length of that tube is L, okay? But that's always going to be, that is a boundary condition where one of them, one end is a node and the other is an anti-node, okay? Now, for the first harmonic, um, lambda equals 4L, so F1 equals V over 4L in this particular case, all right? So look, L, in other words, is one quarter of a wavelength. You see that? This is only from, from zero to maximum, and there's another wave part that comes down here, right? Okay. There is no second harmonic because of the initial boundary condition of there being a node and an anti-node on either end. So let's go to the third harmonic. The third harmonic, which is shown here in the second case, Okay, L equals three quarters of a wavelength. You see there's three quarters of a wavelength that's stuck inside of that tube of length L. Or in other words, lambda is four thirds L. Okay, so the third harmonic, F3, is still an integer multi multiple of the first harmonic or the fundamental frequency. There's no fourth harmonic, again, because of the boundary conditions. The fifth harmonic is so forth, right? Four fifths L is the, is, uh, the wavelength. There's no sixth harmonic, um, et cetera. Okay, all right. So Here's showing all of this information on these particular graphs. Okay, this is a really nice, neat, um, really nice, neat diagram from the Hamper textbook. Okay, so we can sum this all up by noting that the allowed wavelengths must be well. There must be something um, odd about this, and I mean odd integers. And in fact, it's lambda equals four L over n, where n is an odd positive um, non-zero integer. Okay, so you can see by n being 1, 3, 5, 7, etc., it satisfies all of these conditions for each of the second, fourth, sixth, eighth, tenth harmonics, and so forth. All right, really interesting stuff. Again, what, why, why are these odd integers? Well, it's because of the initial boundary conditions of there being a node on one end and an anti node on the other, which comes from the physical fact that one end of the pipe is open and the other is closed. Really cool stuff. Okay. Okay, what about a case where both ends are open? Well, then you would have an antinode on either end, and that is a set of boundary conditions that we must take into account. It's not possible now to get half uh, wavelength along L because both ends are always antinodes. Now, for the first harmonic, you have F1 equals V over 2L. For the second harmonic, it's 2 times F1, so forth, um, so forth, and so forth, okay? All right, so the allowed wavelengths for when both ends are open is 2L over N, where N is any non-zero positive integer, okay? It turns out that in case 3, where both ends are closed, which is an unrealistic weird case, because how would you ever get a wave to even enter, um, it's the same physics, it's the same equation as this, which I'll talk about in the next slide, okay? All right, again, the, the allowed wavelengths are the same as with both ends open, okay? Um, this, and like I said, this is more theoretical and not super practical or especially useful, but you should be aware of it, and it actually makes problem solving pretty, pretty straightforward. So a summary from your Sokos book, this is a summary of the allowed wavelengths for standing waves and strings and pipes, and you are responsible for knowing these, okay? Um, very, very important that you, is it a matter of memorizing it? No, it's a matter of, of understanding it and knowing it, but you see the similarities between um, strings and uh, strings with transverse waves and pipes with longitudinal waves in terms of standing waves, okay? So let's do a few examples, all right? A tube has one end open and the other closed. What is the ratio of wavelengths of the fundamental to the third harmonic? Fundamental is the fundamental frequency or first harmonic, okay? Pretty straightforward. Lambda 1 is 4L. Lambda 3 is 4L over 3. Here's where you are expected to understand the application of, of lambda equals 4L to one end open and the other closed. And I got a ratio of 3, right? Okay. Which is obvious, right? Because the third harmonic is always 3 times the fundamental. Okay. Second one, a standing wave is set up in a tube with both ends open. 
okay? The frequency of the fundamental is 300 hertz. What's the length of the tube? Take the speed of sound to be 340, okay? So I'm using the wave equation. Given the information I have, I find that lambda is 1.13 meters. So because both ends are open, here are my boundary conditions, which dictate that equation. And I get um, a length of the tube as 57 centimeters for that one, okay? Let's try another one. Uh, sound of source of frequency um, 2.1 kilohertz is placed at the open end of a tube. The other end is closed. Okay, those are your boundary conditions, right? Stated very clearly at the beginning. Powder is sprinkled inside the tube. When the source is turned on, it is observed that the powder collects in heaps a distance of 8 centimeters apart. Explain this observation. It's very interesting, and it actually might help to um, draw a diagram, which I didn't. And the explanation is as follows. The standing wave is set up inside the tube due to incident and reflected waves interfering, right? You can imagine this being a paper two question. At the antinodes, there's a maximum displacement of molecules, and here the powder is pushed to the right and left the most. The powder then collects at the nodes where the air molecules do not move, okay? All right. Now, how would you determine the speed of sound used given that particular information. Well, again, the heaps collect at the nodes, and the distance between the nodes are, by definition, a half a wavelength. So the wavelength would be 16 centimeters, and then using the wave equation, we can deduce that the speed of the sound used is about 340 meters per second. Voila! Pretty cool, huh? Okay, let's try another example. All right, a tube is placed, and we will do this. We'll, I'll demonstrate this to you in class, and in fact, we're going to do a lab dealing with this. This is really cool stuff. It turns out that if you place a tube that's uh, open on both ends in water, as shown, thereby making one end closed and one end open, when you sound a tuning fork above it and you change the length of the tube, right, between the open end and the closed end, which is the end with water, you can um, set up standing waves in that pipe and get uh, and get positive interference on the end, which makes the, the, the sound much louder. We'll, we'll do that in class, okay? When a tuning fork is sounded, a loud sound comes out of the tube, okay, which is what I was just talking about. The shortest length of the column of air for which this happens is L. Okay, that's the fundamental frequency. The frequency of the tuning fork is 486 and the speed of sound is 340. Determine the length L. Here's how you would do this problem. Okay, wave equation, you're given what you're given here, you get that lambda is 0.7 meters. Now, the wave must be the first harmonic, and this is a case of one end open and the other closed. So here's my boundary condition. Again, the boundary conditions uh, dictate that I use lambda equals 4L. L is one quarter of a wavelength, which is about 17 centimeters. Predict the least distance by which the tube must be raised for another loud sound to be heard from the tube when the same tuning fork is sounding. It's an interesting question, right? The length of the air column must be increased so the next harmonic can sort of fit into that space of L. The tube must be raised a half a wavelength to accommodate another wavelength, right? And this height would then be half of the 70 centimeters, which is 35 centimeters.